Joining us this morning to look through the newspaper headlines, front pages and big stories, we've got Portia Barry Kilby, political commentator and contributor to Young Voices UK. Portia, good morning. Morning, Callum. Nice to have you with us. Right, shall we start then with what is dominating the front pages this morning, and that is uh, the Prime Minister's plans on social care, uh, looking likely that he's going to go ahead and, and push through uh, a rise in national insurance to uh, to try to address uh, social care. And it also feels like uh, sort of rumours of a cabinet reshuffle are what is keeping uh, cabinet ministers at bay on this, where the suggestion, the reporting this morning, Portia, is that they don't actually fully support this idea, but because of threats of a reshuffle that it sounds like they're going to get in line and go along with it um, a rise in national insurance does it feel like the the right way to tackle the social care problems uh, that we have to you to me absolutely not especially how it's being introduced almost by a backdoor method because it's first and foremost being introduced to tackle the nhs backlog so it seems Everything is done with the reason to protect the NHS. A year ago, we were told to stay home to protect the NHS. Now we're told to go out, earn lots of money, pay lots of tax in order to protect the NHS and deal with the backlog only for that same increase in national insurance to pay for the social care issue, which existed long before COVID and violates a clear uh, manifesto pledge made by the party in back in 2019. Yeah, well, that's an interesting point, the manifesto pledge point. Um, actually, we've got... Uh, who emailed me? We've got an email from one of our listeners um, asking, uh, it's Duncan, who says, is this the plan Boris had in mind when he spoke on the steps of Downing Street after his election win in 2019? If so, he was planning to break his election manifesto pledges just hours after victory, um, suggests Duncan. And you can see Duncan's point, can't you? How, how important is that, do you think, that the idea that uh, this goes against what was promised in a manifesto that let's be honest does it did anybody really read the manifesto did anybody care about the manifesto i mean i think it is important especially when there is the pensions triple lock being rumors that that will end mm. that can be understood in light of covid because of increase in wages and the triple lock doesn't make any sense at all especially for this moment in time whereas with social care the problem was there way before covid so it seems as though to make to go back on one promise is foolish. Well, it's unfortunate to go back on two is foolish, sort of thing. Um, yeah, it is not doesn't instill confidence in the government at all. Yeah, I, you, obviously you're from Young Voices UK, so interesting to put uh, former Chancellor Norman Lamont's comments to you, saying that a rise in income tax rather than national insurance contributions would be more widely spread and not hit younger workers as hard. Are you are you feeling hard done by at this point that the suggestion is that it's national insurance that's going to go up? For sure, especially when it is funding social care for older people. Um, even if you're 65 and over and still earning a wage, those people will not be paying this increase in national insurance, even though it will benefit them far more quickly than it will benefit someone my age. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Well, YouGov have found, this is on the front page of the Times this morning, that two thirds of the public say they would support national insurance going up from 12% to 13% um, for the NHS and, and social care, and that it would be more popular than putting up income tax. So is it fair to say then that the Prime Minister is actually gauging the mood of the nation quite appropriately here? I think it's a very delicate way of putting what is essentially a tax increase by saying it's an increase in national insurance. And of course, it means that businesses are contributing somewhat as well, so it shares the burden out. But I think two thirds support it. I'm not sure that will be the case when it comes mm. to reduced balance in their bank account. Uh, young face tax crunch is the Metro's headline. Um, the paper going on that line that, that younger workers will be uh, hit the hardest. Um, the Daily Mail says the majority of the cabinet are opposed to the idea. Um, the paper quotes an insider saying, I've seen it reported that five cabinet ministers are opposed to the idea, uh, which is quite an elusive quote. However, the point kind of stands, doesn't it, Portia, that, that actually it sounds like Boris Johnson is using the threat of reshuffling people out if there is no support. Um, quite an interesting sort of tactic that, that. The word used on the front of the Times is that he's in invincible mode. Do you, do you think Boris Johnson is, is invincible? I don't think the past year would really give him cause to be, feel invincible at the moment. Um, yeah, it seems slightly dirty tactics to get this through, especially as there seems such opposition from the government. And rightfully so. You don't want to be the party in power having broken everything you promised to do back in 2019.
Uh, let's go on to one of the other stories that's uh, kind of bubbling away after uh, the weekend and uh, after an interview that uh, on Times Radio with Nadim Zahawi, the vaccines minister. Uh, he was speaking to Tom Newton-Dunn uh, yesterday and it's all about the idea of uh, teenagers, of vaccinating teenagers. Um, and I just want you to have a little listen to how this unfolded on, on Times Radio yesterday. So this is from uh, Tom Newton-Dunn's programme yesterday morning. I was going to ask you about that as well. Uh, what uh, what do you do? So Parents the, said no. Teenager says yes. What do you well, then do? Well, the, the NHS is, is really well practised in this because they've, they've been doing school organisation programmes uh, for a very long time. So what, what you essentially do is make sure that the clinicians uh, discuss this with the parents, with the uh, uh, teenager, and if they are then deemed to be able to make a decision that is competent, um, then that decision will 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 go uh, in the favour of, of what the uh, teenager um, uh, decides uh, to do. That's fascinating. So, probably... so, to, so to be clear, the teenager can override the lack of parental consent. If the teenager really wants the jab, with only fifteen, the parents say no. The teenager could have it, it uh, if they're deemed to be competent to make that decision with all the information available. To them. So there you go. Vaccines Minister Nadim Zahawi on Times Radio. Now, at the risk of adding obfuscation and confusion, let's have a listen to Nadim Zahawi speaking to Sky News yesterday morning. Can you assure parents that if there is a decision to vaccinate 12 to 15 year olds, it will require parental consent? I can give that assurance, absolutely. So there we are. Uh, <laughs> Portia, where are we at with this? What on earth is going on? I mean, it's kind of a mess. It's, it honestly is baffling that parents' decision on this could be overridden and that you have the minister saying this publicly and then in very couched terms of, oh, if the student is competent enough. Well, what does that mean for a start? Is it they're only deemed competent if they want to be vaccinated and the parents refuse, but if they don't want to be vaccinated but the parents support them being vaccinated, oh, sorry, your parents' decision overrules yours? It does seem very curious, to say the least. Mm. I think what what's potentially uh, adds to the confusion on this further is the the JCVI statement uh, in the last few days, saying the available evidence indicates that the individual health benefits from COVID nineteen vaccination are small in those aged twelve to fifteen years who do not have underlying health conditions, which put them at risk of severe COVID nineteen. Uh, and so, in terms of sort of following, you know, data, not dates, you know, going with the science, depending on people like the JCVI members, um, where why why is this such a confusing chapter in in the pandemic? And in the vaccination story? Yeah, I think there's a lot more hesitancy over vaccinating young people. I think parents who would be very happy to have a vaccine themselves wouldn't want their children to have the vaccine, especially as, according to the Joint Committee, there is considerable uncertainty regarding the magnitude of potential harms. Um, other countries have recommended that 12 to 15 year olds get vaccinated, but we haven't followed suit with other countries on all of their policy decisions. And certain senior scientific advisors to the government said that most teenagers would want to be vaccinated or would at least prefer to be vaccinated. But that seems a very weak argument for pushing through the option given to children when since when did the government listen to the whims of any 13 year old? <laughs> so uh, where would you like this to conclude? What, what is what is a good outcome as far as you're concerned when it comes to vaccinating teenagers and children? So I believe the JCVI said it would take several months to really determine how great magnitude the potential harms will pose. There seems very little reason to push it through now. The disruption to education was largely due to guidelines issued by the government on sending children home from school if one person tested positive. There's no need for that if they are being tested. And even if they catch COVID, the risk is so low. So I think... They should hold off and definitely not roll out the vaccine for young people at this point. Yeah, understood. Just as a, as a quick final thought then, just on another sort of COVID line that's around as well, it's about vaccine passports. Uh, a senior minister saying that vaccine passports for large venues and mass gatherings are needed to avoid another national lockdown. Um, if it was a choice for you between passports or lockdown, which one would you go for? 
Oh, I think that's between uh, two very awful choices. I don't think either are necessary, especially when it comes to vaccine passports. You can still pass on the virus and catch the virus if you are vaccinated. Yeah. So they're not really got a strong argument there. Uh, that is uh, from Nadim Zahawi as well, incidentally, the vaccine uh, <laughs> minister. He had quite the day of it uh, yesterday, I think. Uh, Portia, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, Callum. Speak again soon. That's uh, Portia Berry-Kilby, political commentator and contributor to Young Voices UK. Um, 